Hello and welcome to episode 330 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? I'm, I'm feeling like a bit of a winner this week, Andy, if, I, if truth be told, because I suppose I've got to give a nod to Jordan. So regular listeners will know Jordan Cox. He is a friend of the show, but he's also been writing our Money to the Masses deal section. So if you go on the website and you search deals, there's a page that Jordan updates daily with his pick of the deals that are out there. And this week, I've actually used one of those deals. It was one that related to birthday cards. And actually, I've probably given it away to the person who listens to the podcast, who I'll be sending the birthday card to. But you're able to get a free card, effectively. So I've just told them that I haven't paid anything towards their birthday. But I felt like I was being a bit of a coupon kid myself. So I even informed Jordan of that uh, via social media, which is good. And the other thing, which was kind of unrelated, but is Jordan inspired, is I found out I won a game this week. I've not got it yet. But you know the competitions that you do, and, and, and Jordan is a big competition fan. And I think I'll have to get him on the podcast to talk about it at some point. But I know that he does competitions. And I was standing there looking at a bottle of squash in my kitchen that I was making myself a drink. And on the back of it, it said there was, I think, 25,000 Hasbro board games that could be won and you had to just scan a code and you enter your details and anyone who's been listening to the podcast since lockdown will know that I'm a big board game fan and so I just thought well 25,000 who's going to do that that's loads so I entered and uh, I found out this week that I've I've won I don't know which game I've won it's going to just turn up it's probably going to be a game I've already got um, I'm hoping it's not Monopoly to be honest with you because it's going to be, it's the old version as we talked about recently I'm not a fan of Monopoly so I just feel a bit of a winner this week Andy well we shall wait and see what that game will be Damon I'm sure you'll update the listeners on the pod as to what arrived in the post I bagged myself a deal actually from Jordan Steele's page on the money to the masses website not quite as sort of noble as you getting free birthday cards I I bagged myself a triple cheeseburger for 99p and I sort of guiltily ate that on the way home (laughs) from work the other day so I then had a big dinner afterwards and it just felt wrong did you eat your dinner though oh yeah of course I did (laughs) It didn't, it didn't really feel like it. I felt sick, like the advert. Um, no, I, I like that. I had to stop myself using that particular deal. I'm a fan of fast food anyway, and I don't need to be encouraged with my Crohn's disease to eat anything unhealthy. So good, we're, we're winning on the deals front. So I'm going to tell you what's on the pod this week. We've got three pieces. We've got Laura back on the pod, actually, this week. She's going to do something about best cashback credit cards. So deal inspired, inspired about cashback. There's a lot of credit cards out there that do cashback, but which ones are the best? And Laura is our credit expert. So she's coming on the show to discuss that. I'm going to do a piece about funding later life care. So going into nursing homes or having care at home when you're elderly and the other piece i'm going to talk about briefly is green mortgages so what are they and how do they work okay so let's start with the funding of later life care we've got a piece on this explaining sort of how it works things that people can do and think about now they may well obviously be thinking for themselves or maybe elderly family or relatives what have we got so later life care there was some research that was carried out and people don't really think about it or plan for it and those who were asked in this piece of research i think was carried out by hargreaves lansdowne suggested that a third of people thought the parents would have to sell their home to fund their care and 10 percent of people thought that they're going to have to fund the care for their parents themselves so it just shows you this is a an issue that's going to be facing all of us at some point so what i wanted to do today it's a topic we've never really covered on the podcast i want to give people a high level understanding of how it roughly works so when they're thinking well are they going to take all my money and make me pay for my care or is the government or anybody going to help fund it and so the first thing to bear in mind is that the cost of care varies it depends if you're having care at home or if you're going into a care home full-time or a nursing home full-time. And if we look at funding care at home, first of all, like any of this really, and it goes for care home costs as well, that the amount that you pay will vary from person to person. It's not fixed. So it will depend largely on where you live. When you're having care at home, it will obviously depend on how much care you need, the extent of the care, and then the amount that you'll pay will depend about how much you can contribute yourself. So there are obviously people who have their care funded, and that's what we're going to go on to and explain. So if we focus on the care at home, the cost varies, but roughly speaking, it's about £15 an hour. That's the average cost, according to research. Now, 
you can go and look at the UK Home Care Association website. We'll put a link that can help find care services that you can have at home. Now, obviously, you can self-fund, so you can pay to have, let's say, an elderly relative have full-time care in their own house. But for most people, they will be looking to see if there's any help they can get because it's an expensive service. You can get help from your local council and the way that's done is that you will need to have a care needs assessment carried out for the person who's going to need the care and that will usually be achieved via a referral from a gp or care or district nurse and you'll get that assessment done if you are eligible for the care you can then have a financial assessment and what happens is the local council will assess your financial circumstances and if you are found to be eligible for financial support then your local council can arrange for the care services for you or alternatively they can pay payments to you directly and you arrange the care yourself now how much support you will get financially will be decided after you've had a means test so the person who is needing the care will undergo a means test a financial means test and they will look at the person's capital and income and the capital will include things like savings for example when it's talking about care at home they don't look at your house they don't take your house into account in the assessment because obviously you've got to live in it but they will look at your capital and your income if your income can cover that need so that person who's having the care they have sufficient income coming in that can pay for their care then it's unlikely they're going to get any support when they look at the capital amount that you have what they tend to do in england if you have less than fourteen thousand two hundred and fifty pounds excluding your property then your council will pay for your care if you have between fourteen thousand two hundred and fifty pound and twenty three thousand two hundred and fifty pound then your council will fund some of your care and you must contribute the rest if you have over twenty three thousand two hundred and fifty pounds then you have to pay all your fees yourself and you're known as self-funding so you can see there that a lot of people will end up self-funding there'll be people if they don't have assets other than their house that are worth over £23,250 if they don't have that then they will get some kind of financial assistance so that's the starting point now we talk about how do you fund the care so if you've got to pay for all of it or some of it how will the person who needs the care fund that now obviously you could have a, a relative could pay for the care they could actually contribute towards it that's up to them but one option is equity release now if you go back and look at podcast episode 53 not look at listen i should say then we talked about equity release in that episode and in episode 88 we talked about the alternatives to equity release as well so i'm not going to dwell on it here on the podcast because the podcast will be too long we've covered it before but equity release allows you to release money from a house so the person who needs the care could use equity release to perhaps release some money for their care but the key thing people have to realize you can't release all the equity you have in a house there are conditions on it and it varies from person to person based partly on their age which will determine how much money they can take out so they could use something like equity release or they could obviously use investments that they may have to provide the funds necessary to pay for the care now we'll move on to care homes because obviously if you're going to a care or nursing home the costs are much higher broadly speaking there's a calculator which I will link to in the show notes which will show you the average cost of the care that the person might need but for a care home it's about a thousand pounds a week for a nursing home so they have a little bit more care in a nursing home that is about 1400 pounds a week on average across the uk so it's a lot of money and research by legal and general showed that one in ten people who move into a care home are still alive six years later so that is a huge sum that you could end up paying over a long period of time and bupa said you could end up paying over 193,000 pound over the course of care in the uk so it's a significant amount of money so when it comes to funding care in a care home or nursing home there are largely three options so the local authority could fund it you could self-fund it or it can in some cases be funded by the nhs so let's look at the local authority funding first of all again there's the assessment that you're going to have to have when we look at the financial assessment again there are these capital limits that are applied so in england it's twenty three thousand two hundred and fifty, as i mentioned earlier scotland it's twenty eight thousand seven hundred and fifty, and in wales it's fifty thousand pounds so you've had your eligibility needs test so the authority assesses whether you need the care you have your financial test again and then they will see whether they'll be able to contribute towards it or whether you're going to have to self-fund the difference with the assessment for a care home 
is that your house can be taken into account. Now, the times where your property isn't included in the calculation, if, for example, the partner of the person needing the care was still to live there. So let's say if you're looking at your parents, if, say, your father was needing the care and was going to have to go into a care or nursing home, but your mum was still going to be living at the house, then they wouldn't take into account the value of the property in their assessment. But the means test is very similar in every other way. And with the same boundaries that I mentioned previously, that will assess whether you get any help from the local council. The one thing that they will do, once they've taken into account all of your capital in that means test, you need to be left with a personal expenses allowance, which is £24.90 a week. So that can be increased over time, but it's at their discretion. So you have to have an element of money left over as well. Now, if you do get the funding for a care home, obviously, you might not like the choice of care home that they're going to fund, you can top up and actually pay an additional amount for a more expensive care home. So that could be, for example, if it was your parents, you may personally top it up. So they go to a slightly better home to so top up the amount that they're going to be given by the local authority to be able to be looked after. Now, if you are a self funder, so the person who's going to go into care is going to have to pay it for themselves. So they're the self funder, then typically the way people do do it is to sell their home if they can. So that means that there isn't somebody living in, in the house like their spouse, then they would sell their home and that could fund the care that they need. They could potentially rent out their home and derive an income which could pay for their care or other ways of doing it. Again, we could get onto equity release and the alternative that I mentioned earlier on. So go back and listen to those podcasts. One side thing I would mention quickly is that make sure people check their benefits that they're entitled to. So if you're doing this for your parents, go on to entitled2.co.uk and find out what benefits they are entitled to and they're claiming all of those because that might be able to help them so it could be something like pension credit they haven't actually claimed for now if the property is going to be included in the means test then the council has to ignore it for the first 12 weeks of your care and that's because it gives you space to decide what you're going to do with the property and pay fees or you could enter into something called a deferred payment agreement with the council now this is quite interesting for some people out there what it does it allows the person to effectively get a loan with the local authority that's secured against the home at a fixed interest rate and the loan is set up to be repaid after the person dies and the home is sold in the meantime the council will cover the cost of the care so again it's subject to means testing so you have to have in england capital less than twenty three thousand two hundred and fifty pounds and you own the home and there isn't anyone living in the property like a spouse a child or someone aged over the age of 60 now the other thing to bear in mind is that local authorities are not obliged to offer this deferred payment arrangement but if they don't then they have to give you a reason why they don't in writing so for example they might not think your house is actually valuable enough to cover the fees of course what happens if you were to run out of money now, that would mean that your assets fall below those threshold levels then of course the local authority will step in they do have a duty of care and unfortunately i've seen this happen in my own life where somebody's assets are slowly or not slowly very quickly dwindled by having to pay for their own care i mean it was interesting when i was doing this piece talking to people and financial planners how people actually pay for their long-term care other ways they might fund it there aren't really any insurances as such out there that are being used to help insure against this eventuality there are some new life insurance based products that have a kind of add-on that can be used basically if you don't claim under the a critical illness type policy and it converts into a policy that will pay out when you're older if you need it to if you get dementia etc so but that's something we might cover on a, on a future podcast but the other thing that is possible you can get something called an immediate needs annuity which is effectively a type of policy that provides a regular income in exchange for an upfront lump sum investment so its aim is to pay in a tax-free amount that goes directly to the care home but of course, this is something that isn't widely used, but you need advice. But I would suggest you seek financial advice anyway. And the other thing people do is they just invest for the future to try and cover a lot of these fees. So the message on this part of the podcast is that if you have assets, you're unlikely to get much support from the local government for your care. But 
they will eventually have to step in. Now, of course, this leads to a follow-up question about what happens if people start deliberately giving away their assets to try and deplete them ahead of time. And that's called deliberate deprivation. And so there are rules around this that can stop you. So local authorities can go back and say, the person who is due to have the care or need started giving away their money so it wouldn't be included in the assessment and have to pay for their own care. Now, I'll put a link to some rules around that, actually. But there isn't really a time frame on that. So you just have to be careful. If you're going to do this, you think there's going to be a need for care, then if you start giving away money, then don't be surprised if the local authority come back and look at your records and try and assess if you've been trying to give money away. But this is why we need to all start planning that bit further ahead, because if we think that could happen, that's why people would be better off giving away their money further in the future or planning or investing or whatever it is they want to do. So the message of this piece of the podcast is that plan for the future. There was discussions surrounding increasing the limits. I think it was actually part of the uh, manifesto for the Conservatives to increase that level to much higher, but it's never actually happened. So at the moment, it's still for England around about £23,000. And there are some instances where the NHS can step in and pay for care as well if you've got a particular uh, medical need. And we include that in the article, which we will link to in the show notes. But it's called NHS Continuing Healthcare and NHS Funding Nursing Care. But as I say, that's more if you've got a medical need for that care. Okay, moving on then. So green mortgages, what are they? Who are they good for? Why would you use them? What have we got on this piece? Now, this is going to be a relatively quick piece because green mortgages, people have probably never ever heard of them. And it's something that I've only become recently more aware of. Now, green mortgage is effectively a mortgage that gives you some form of deal or money off cash back or whatever it is if you have an energy efficient property typically if you look at the energy performance certificates so the epc rating it normally is either a or b so there are about three real main types of green mortgages. There are ones that offer you a lower rate for people who buy energy efficient properties. There's mortgages that are green mortgages that what they do is they give cash back on the standard range of mortgages that lender provides to people who buy energy efficient properties. And then there's a third type where the lender offers mortgages with cheaper rates or cash back when people make green home improvements. So the first type, Barclays and Nat West are examples of that. So what they will do is give people a lower interest rate when they buy energy efficient properties nationwide offer one where they give cash back on their standard mortgage range and that can be as much as 500 pound if you've got the top a rated energy efficient home and then the third type again this one is nationwide where the lender gives people additional borrowing for up to say 25,000 pound but they give them a reduced rate on that borrowing so as long as that borrowing has been used to make green home improvements so you can see these green mortgages are particularly attractive to people who are buying probably newer homes because they will be energy efficient anyway but you can get better deals now people listening to this podcast will be sitting there thinking yeah okay but are these deals better than the deals that are out there for everybody else the mainstream deals and de facto looked at some of the numbers and they found that there are a couple of deals on the two-year fixed range that were cheaper than the best deal on the standard wider market but on the five-year fixed deals then the green mortgages were among the lowest rates available almost in all cases and more widely so the message of this part of the podcast is if you are going to buy an energy efficient home or you're going to make home improvements that make your home more energy efficient you're thinking along those lines then do look for green mortgages speak to a mortgage broker and ask about them because they do exist and you can get cash back or you can get a cheaper rate of borrowing so this is a movement that we're seeing even in the buy to let mortgage market Bronte did an article actually in the last week or so which looked at the buy to let mortgage market in particular and the green mortgages that are available to landlords now in that buy to let market there are very few lenders but in the residential market there are a lot more lenders i think there's over 20 when i was looking at the notes that i was researching so it's something for people to think about green mortgages it seems to be something of a future it's a growing trend and something to consider if you are going to buy a new house Okay, so for the last piece of the pod, I'm going to welcome Laura back to the show, who's going to be covering cashback credit cards, what they are, what they do. Laura, welcome back to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. Yeah, good to be here as always. Great to have you back then, Laura. So why cashback cards? What are we talking about today? 
So cashback credit cards are always an interesting area of the market because in essence, they allow you to earn extra money on your everyday spending. um, And you don't really need to do anything additional other than using your credit card. I think they're particularly interesting at the moment because there have been some big changes from some of the bigger companies in this space. So the biggest name in cashback and rewards is American Express, and they're making some fundamental changes to the cashback that they offer on some of these very popular cards. Okay, interesting. So, I mean, in essence, what is a cashback card? How do you apply for one? How does it work? Just just run us through as briefly how they work. A cashback credit card is principally exactly the same as any other credit card. You use it in the same way and apply for it in the same way. The difference is that on your everyday spending, so whether you're food shopping, filling up your car with petrol, or just paying for day-to-day activities, you are rewarded with a certain percentage of cashback on that spending. So this may be given to you either monthly or with some of these cards annually, and it takes your total balance of all of your spending on the card, and you will typically get between 0.5 and 1% cashback on the most competitive deals. So it's not just restricted to certain retailers. I know with some cards like the Curve card, for example, or you, you're limited either in the amount of time it will offer the cashback for or the number of retailers you can actually use it on. With a cashback card, it's kind of across the board. It'll be a percentage on everything you spend. Is that how it works? That's exactly right. So in contrast to rewards credit cards where you're more limited to sort of showing loyalty for certain retailers, with a cashback card, you're being rewarded with that cash back across the board on all of your spending. Having said that, you may get particular bonuses or perks if you are spending in a particular way with a particular retailer, but generally it's just a blanket cash back reward on all of your spending. And I know with some cards, for example, there are either limits on the amount that it will do, or you can enter into a different tier once you spend a certain amount on that card. Is that right? Yeah, certainly with some of the top cashback cards, it works in such a way that if you spend a certain amount, either within the initial few months or over the course of a year, that if you enter into the next tier, you earn a higher rate of cashback. So a prime example of this is with American Express, where if you spend up to, well, it used to be £5,000 per year, you'd earn 0.5%. It's now changing that if you spend up to £10,000 a year, you get 0.5%. But if you spend over £10,000 a year on the card, you'll receive 1% cash back on all of your spending. So we've covered the fact that it's cash back on everything. Just to kind of understand how that works with certain individual cards. Can you give some examples on the bigger card providers on the the type of cashback cards they do? Well, a market leader in this area is definitely the American Express Platinum Cashback Everyday card. The appeal of this one is it doesn't have an annual fee, which is actually quite rare among the American Express Cashback card range. And with this particular card, you'll earn 5% cashback up to a value of £100 in the first three months after you take out the card. And then after that, there is a ongoing rate of 0.5% up to £10,000 a year, and then 1% on spending over £10,000 a year. So you'd really want to have to be spending quite a lot to really benefit from that upper rate. Okay, and what about the cards that charge a fee? How do they compare in terms of the tiers and the cashback they offer? So outside of the American Express stable of cards, another one I'd highlight is the Santander All-in-One card. And with this card, you earn 0.5% on all of your cashback. There isn't really that tiered approach. And so it offers you just a steady rate and without that attractive initial offer, but just a good, solid cashback rate, certainly 
one of the more competitive ones in the market at the moment. However, that does come with a £3 a month fee. So you need to really be aware that that is going to eat away at some of those cashback rewards that you're getting. Okay, so we've mentioned a couple of really good cards there. And I know that we've got the article on the website, which you update regularly. What we'll do is we'll put a, a link to that in the show notes. And as I say, that has been updated all the time. And as soon as we're made aware of any of these cashback deals, they're going to go onto that page. And so you can bookmark that and see at any time what the best cashback cards are. So kind of finishing off this piece, then we've covered what cashback cards are. And we've given a couple of examples of some good deals there. Who exactly are these cashback cards aimed at? Who are they good for? Who's going to benefit from them? And is there like a any tips that you would give in terms of how to use these cards? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's worth noting that most of the most competitive deals are really only going to be available to those who've got an excellent credit score. They're really those kind of prime cards. You're not really going to be able to get one of these cards if you've got either not very much credit history or you've got an impaired credit history. So, but if if you do qualify for one of these cards, I'd always recommend using an eligibility checker before you apply so that it doesn't leave a footprint on your credit file. They're really good for people who are disciplined in how they use their card. So you really need to make sure that you are paying back the balance in full each month so that you don't end up paying interest on your spending on the card, which almost automatically wipes out any cashback benefit. You also need to be aware of not spending additional money on the card over and above your normal spending that you would have done. It's not worth spending extra in order to earn a little bit of extra cash back. However, having said that, if you just use your card for the spending that you would have been doing anyway, if you pay the balance off in full each month, you're literally getting this nice bonus either monthly or at the end of the year. And it can quite quickly add up to quite a nice amount. I think that's a really good tip, actually. And and one thing that I do, I, I use a cashback card. I use the Amex card and I actually took it out just before Christmas. So my cashback is always due annually around Christmas time. And it, last year it was about £260 and it ended up paying for a shark vacuum. Now, I know... <laughs> I know it's not exciting, but £260 wasn't to be sniffed at. And just before Christmas, when you've got other things to worry about financially, it was a real welcome bonus for me. So I really enjoyed that. Oh, and just another tip on that while I'm talking about, you know, little tips and tricks that you've given already. You can use these cashback cards often with other apps. So if, if you're already into cashback or you want to get into it, you can use apps like Top Cashback and also Quidco. You'd have to check the terms and conditions just because some retailers, it may be slightly different. Sometimes they say not available with other offers. But generally speaking, if you use a cashback app and then you use your cashback card to pay for that particular offer or deal, you can double up those rewards. So very quickly, you can start earning some really decent money as cashback. And again, those cashback rewards that you get through the apps will be a different time frame. Sometimes they'll pay within a couple of months, maybe it's a few months, six months. So you're not going to be getting the cash back at the same time as you get it on your card, but it's all a bonus. So that's brilliant. Thanks ever so much for coming back on, Laura. So Damien, that is it for this week. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Twitter, it's at moneytothemasses with a number two. We are on Instagram, Facebook. And as we mentioned last week, we are also on TikTok. So check us out over there as well. Damien, we're done for this week. Until next time. Yes, until next time. Thank you.